Hi, welcome to My Soul. If I was to say to you, Smokey Robinson, Marvin Gaye, Stevie Wonder, Michael Jackson, Minnie Ripperton, Quincy Jones, Maxwell, Norman Connors, Chuck Jackson, uh, Carl Anderson, Isley Brothers, Ike and Tina Turner, Donna Hath Donnie Hathaway, Jackson 5, The Miracles, Martha Reeves, Nancy Wilson, Thelma Jones, Tina Marie, Jeffrey Osborne, Mario Biondi, John Legend, to name but a few. Who do they have in common? They have Mr. Leon Ware. Leon Ware? He's right here. We have our first legend in the My Soul Studios for a special interview exclusively for My Soul. Welcome. Can you please preface that by saying living legend? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's apparent. <laughs> no, it's like I'm, I, I, I make fun of it because of uh, just the fact that it's used a lot. I, I'm connected with some really brilliant talent and uh, unfortunately a lot. <laughs> You're still going very strong. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to still be here to, to say hi, looking forward to meeting, greeting, and serving as much more love as I possibly can. So let's, let's go back to the beginning. How did it all start for you musically? Where did it all begin for you? As a child, three and a half years old, my sister snuck me out of the house, put me on a stage, and I sung a song called Caledonia. It's playing the piano. Caledonia, Caledonia, what makes your big head so hard? Boom! That was my entrance as a kid. And my idol, uh, then was a kid named Sugar Child Robinson, who uh, unfortunately didn't blossom into it, the talent that he could have been or should have been. But uh, three and a half, and I won that contest, by the way, and I've since been, I'd say, in love with applause. I remember asking my sister, and she used to kid me about it years later. As we were leaving the stage, I looked up at her and I said, do they really like me? Because it was such a, a, large, amount, a large amount of, of applause. And she says, yes, honey, I think they really like you a lot. So from that to now, I am... Uh, Gifted with the fact that I've met, worked with, and had some memorable work with uh, enough people not to count it, but at the same time just enough to make note that the love that I have inside me for the art itself, songwriting and singing and being a performer, is still alive and well. And I'm glad to still be alive. Jane, I just had my 74th birthday. That's incredible. And you're still recording? I'm still recording. Performing? So from that point, from age three and a half, when you won that competition, was that when you knew this is for me? No, no, no. I always say, people say, when did you get into music? I always say, it wasn't me getting into music, it was music getting into me. Okay. So some people that, uh, as Quincy said to me um, in one of our various conversations, he looked at me and says, you know, says, there's a lot of talented people, not a lot of gifted people. He says, you're gifted. He says, so my story, uh, and music is that I do things musically that people, people that have graduated from Juilliard asked me, how did you come up with that? So again, it's, I can only take the credit for the fact of the gift. I don't really know what I'm doing. Quincy said to me, if you know what you were doing, you'd scare yourself. And whether that's, <laughs> whether that's true or not, uh, I kind of live with a bliss of not really being I'm not trained, I'm not programmed or particularly taught to do what I do. It is a gift that I do very freely. It's, it's, it's almost like my, uh, my love life. So, so when did it change from being a hobby and a passion into actually becoming your career? When, how, well, your hobby break? has never been. Passion has always been what When it became a profession for me was, I quit school at 16. Um, I was working with a young man that's now in the Hall of Fame as a writer. And I hadn't seen him for three years. And when I did run into him three years later, he was 19 or I think we're around the same age. Uh, and he was working with a company called Motown. I had known of Motown by way of the man that was there 
had approached me a couple of years before that. I had won another contest and he was there and he wanted to produce me. However, uh, that didn't work out or that didn't happen. Um, but from 16 to 19, I was pretty much a product of the streets. Not unhappy about it or not even proud of it. It was just the neighborhood I grew up in in Detroit was um, what would be considered a ghetto. Uh, and the young man that was, we, were, we slept over each other's house from time to time. We had a group called the Romeos and he turned out to be, a, a, as I say, a Hall of, Fa Hall of Famer writer. He is the, the middle of Holland Dozier Holland. His name is Lamont Dozier. And I'm as proud of knowing him as I am of knowing Barry, because it was Barry who, oh, oh, at 17, um, came, um, introduced himself to me. I just won a, a local contest at a club called the 20 Grand. He walked up to me and he says, you know, he says, you could be the soulful Johnny Mathis. That was when Johnny Mathis was really, really big, and I kind of took that as a major compliment because I was such a fan of Johnny's. And we started something that was never, never really finished because he was, he had Jackie Wilson. He was working with a group called the Gaylords, and another young lady. I can't remember her name right now, but anyway, it was three artists he was working with, and I was a 17-year-old kid. He was very impatient, so it didn't work out in. 1963, uh, a gentleman that also, because Detroit was so small, as far as the whole, whole circumference of the, of the city itself, that everybody knew everybody. And if you were slightly talented, you were definitely known. I was in the same group of people as Smokey and Lamont and Maritha and just, uh, a slew of really talented people. And around 23, uh, Mickey Stevenson, who had just got to be the vice president of Motown, because Barry was kind of like, I guess he was tired of the pressure. Not the pleasure, but the pressure. Uh, and he gave that particular position to Mickey. And Mickey then, because I was actually driving as a chauffeur for Mickey for almost a year. And one day, Mickey heard me upstairs on the piano. He came up and said, was that you playing? I said, and I looked at him and I said, I guess it must be because there's nobody else there. <laughs> <laughs> so he says, Leon, he says, play what you play for me. He said, he says, is that your stuff? I said, I never heard anything like it. And I said, yeah. I said, he said, you can really be a writer. You want me to sign him? I said, boy, he didn't know that. Um, I had wanted to be at Motown since I had run into M Lamont. I can take you back. Uh, I didn't see Lamont for three or four years. Around the time that the Supremes had had um, Baby Baby, uh, where, the, where the first big cut was, was when I seen Lamont. And Lamont was very sharp. Now, this is a couple of years after this, excuse me. He picked me up in this Cadillac car. I'll never forget this. Drove me home. I got out of the car, he drove away, and I stood there, and I watched that car until he, it disappeared. And he had said to me, he said, you know, man, he said, because I was totally convinced I was going to be a jazz artist. It was all I was interested in, playing jazz, singing jazz. And when he left, he said, you know, he said, so, you know, you, we, we know you can write, why don't you come over? And I'm thinking to myself, I had said to him, I must imagine uh, two years prior to that, that I was only interested in doing jazz. Anyway, so as he drove away, I thought to myself, you know what? I kind of like that car he's driving. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of like that the car. looks pretty good. I could probably look pretty, pretty good in a car like that myself. So two weeks later, I had the number one song in Detroit. And uh, the, re the story is... And what sport was that song? That was the it, was first? Called, it was called Warning. It's by an artist that later on became the background singer for Isaac Hayes, but she didn't develop into being a major artist. But it was, as I say to people, it was kind of easy for me to 
make my decision between singing and writing songs because by the time I was 23 years old, quite a few people had heard me playing the piano and all insisted that I should write songs. The songwriting writing was something that, that came so easy to me, I felt like uh, I wanted to do was really getting hard, was hard for me. Not hard for me to sing, but hard for people to uh, get people to call me back. And around 23, it, the, the decision was very easy to make. I was being called a lot to write. I wasn't being called to sing. So songwriting became as much of a passion for me as singing did as it was, or as it was where a lot of my friends thought my, my success would be as a song as a songwriter. So, so when was that? Around the late sixties. No, it was the early sixties. Early sixties. Right. In fact, my first hit was 1964 on a group called the Odyssey Brothers. Yeah. A song called "Got to Have You Back." Yeah. And Jam has not stopped. I always say, interestingly enough, about our planet, if you become known to do something really well, everybody knows you. They want to know you. I've never had to call since. Everything that has happened for me since 1965 has been a call. Not me calling, somebody calling. Mm -hmm. Marvin's people, Quincy's people, uh, Alma Irving. I signed one of the biggest publishing contracts with Alma Irving in early 70s, and I was told to t never tell anybody, and I never will. But uh, the gift is really clear because, I, again, I've never had to call. It's been a gift of me answering the phone saying, yes, I can come over and do something. Only thing I can say with the gift stops when it fires me having the talent, knowing what to do with it. <laughs> I can honestly admit I made some not so good decisions as far as who I was working with and whether they were so-called watching my back. So a lot of the if say rewards, financial rewards went to other people. And I'm not mad because it taught me a lesson and um, I'm that still- That's republishing, was it? Yes. And I'm still guilty of the kid that said to some people in a, in a studio many years ago, and some guys almost wanted to beat me up because I said it, because I said it in front of some people that were paying. And my comment was is that, you know, I love this so much, you really don't have to pay me. I still feel the same way, but mm -hmm. I won't say it too loud. <laughs> <laughs> As it is, it's like uh, from early 20s to now, I've been really lucky. Uh, you can call it luck, some people call it skill, I've been called a lot of different things. I won't take the title of being certain things. My, my, uh, my feeling is that the gift is really clear what I do, I never really work at. Every song I've ever written has taken me less than an hour. Uh, What's I, the process I, you go through when you're songwriting? What's... I don't know, it's spiritual. Okay. I worked with a gentleman that had 100 hits when I met him. He wrote Burt Bacharach's Our, Our Day Will Come Any Day Now. He wrote uh, My Little Corner of the World, Dear Hearts and Gentle People. He was, he had two Broadway plays. Um, I would say, I use this word very sparingly, he was a genius. His name was Bob Hilliard. You can look him up in Google and you'll be very surprised how many hits this guy had. And one just hits. These were classic songs. He wrote songs for Sinatra, for uh, Nat King Cole, uh, two of my biggest idols, of course. Because Nat is my biggest idol as far as smooth. Frank is my biggest idol as far as phraseology. And then both combined together were, to me, no singer on the earth comes to that. I mean, you got some young singers now. I like, um, uh, um, to, I'm trying to think his name. He's a young brunette guy that's singing a lot of Frank songs, and he, he's listened to Frank a lot. What's his name? Oh. My wife's niece really loves him a lot. I was. Do you know any of the young jazz singers that's out now? Uh, no, lots of them, yeah. Uh, I don't know who you're all referring to. But he's, he's it's jazz or soul? Or it's jazz. It's um, Robert Glasper? Oh, he's not a singer. Not but, um, no, he's like, uh, 
He's like the gentleman that's a, a, one of the idols of us. Um, um, Gregory Porter. Not Gregory Porter. Say it one more time. His name is Michael mm, Blue Play. Blue Play. Blue Play. Blue Play. Love him. I think he is, he is one of the young vocalists that's keeping with Frank and Nat and myself and people that come from an era where real songwriting, real singing was important. Um, I'll say this very briefly. We've come into an era where the appreciation, the passion, the understanding why people spend their lives being artists has been trashed. Sincerely trashed. I'm not putting the idol down or the voice or the things that are bringing some of the young talent to the front, but the idea that you can be a star because you're on a show for 15 minutes or three months, um, they don't understand. It doesn't come like that. You gotta, you gotta sweat. You gotta love it so much that there are no hours. Uh, and know that the public loves you for being excellent, not for being lucky. Because, mm. I mean, one of the problems with a lot of those shows is there's no longevity to those artists, is there? Well, longevity well, comes. few of them, anyway. Right, that's because longevity is, it's, it's a quality. It takes a quality to be long. And what is happening to a lot of young artists that could really be brilliant artists, they're being deceived by quick fixes and not the real look at what it takes to be an excellent, the word is not even used a lot now, an excellent artist. You don't just happen upon it, it's something that you work at, as I say, hourlessly. There are no 40 hours in the time that you spend. And I hope that myself and the, the people from Blue Blade to the young man that wrote uh, one of my wife's favorite sing uh, uh, Christmas songs. He's also a gifted keyboard player from New Orleans. Uh, what's his name? Um, he's on Idol, right next to Jennifer Lopez. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Do you know what I'm thinking of? Oh, man. Really talented, also very talented, and gifted singer, jazz singer as well. What's his name? Oh, man. Anyway, the world that's listening, uh, uh, the people that are looking, some will know exactly who I'm talking about. And if he's listening, just note that I think of him and Blue Play, and there's a couple of other singers that I'm going to think. Oh, John Legend. Um, just, uh, so taking me back to so that in your early career in the sixties, you were writing for lots of people. Right. Um, you did. You did once in a song with, with the ballads. I don't know if you remember that. Oh yeah. Uh, I wish I knew. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, with Susie Green, uh, um, who was my first wife. Oh, was she? Okay. Oh yeah. My second, I should say. <laughs> I've been married four times. She was my second wife. We got married. Uh, the ballads was the first group I produced in Los Angeles in nineteen sixty seven. That was when Mickey had called me to come out to California to work with him because he was working with a group and he didn't have enough songs. He says, I'm calling you because I know how quick you are. He says, I'm doing this album on, on, on these guys that used to be really big, but they're seemingly on their way out, but they could use some really good songs. The group happened to be uh, um, the uh, sold out the Righteous Brothers. Remember the group? Mm -hmm. And I did five songs on their last album, which really didn't do them that much good because they were having, as I, I learned later, they were having issues as to why that particular piece of product and even product bef that before that wasn't doing that well. And 1967, um, and uh, from, from that was when Mickey introduced me to this group from, I think they were from San Francisco, or from Oakland. And then by the early 70s, you were actually recording yourself and you got your first record deal in 1972. 72. With uh, United Artists. So yes. how, did that, how did that then That transition? happened by way of Ike Turner. I had spent two and a half, well, a year and a half, slightly coherent with Ike and Tina Turner. <laughs> 
a, a good year because he was a good man on one end, he was also a wild man on another end. I won't go into anything other than that. Uh, I'm so glad, so glad that that lady lived long enough to find her way into a place where somebody heard what she could do, or either if it wasn't the record that did it, but something brought her back to life because she was such a gift to the world. And she became who she is today, Tina Turner. You know, and I knew her before she was as big as she is. And uh, if she is listening, if she hears this, she, she should know that I got a song for you now, honey, if you're listening. <laughs> <laughs> but she became such a well-known artist and on those legs and her persona and everything else that, she, that makes Tina Turner, she's such an inspiration to young women. Young women in a way that I wish that I'd say, I would say this, Beyonce don't be mad at me if you hear this. I wish Beyonce would look at where she was, the legs and everything, but sh there's a certain position, there's certain things that certain people do now that take away from them being not, o not only feminine and not only uh, good looking, it's kind of like, it's not, the, it's not climbing the ladder and inspiring young, beautiful women to be females and and remember the, remembering the best thing that they have is their femininity not to exploit it in a way where it's it's looked at as being something less than you know what I mean and I'm sick I think you know what I mean mm -hmm. I don't want to go there because there's some ladies I see that I really adore but I think they've been led by the time and the money and they've forgotten that it's important to be a lady, even though it might not be in this time. But I think that particular quality is timeless. Mm -hmm. Where they're at is timeful. It can be forgotten real easy. Real women will not be forgotten. Mm -hmm. um, so I ask me something else? Please. So speak, speaking, of, <laughs> speaking of women, one of um, the legends that you worked with was Minnie Ripton. You mm. Minnie Ripton, so how was that? Uh, then you go to the epitome of a woman, a woman that walked around and she was the mother of everybody she met. She'd, she'd, she wouldn't have to know you to ask, say to you, you sure you got enough clothing on? Or look at you like she was your mother. She would, you would say to her, Minnie, wait a minute, I'm a big boy. She was such a woman. And the song that we had a lot of success with, even though the sentiment of the song is clearly misunderstood because of the phrase. But the phrase itself, I reminded someone many years ago because a DJ happened to say in his description of the song, okay, we're listening to Miss Ripperton as she is inviting us to come inside her. I stopped the car, cold flat, wherever it was at, I stopped the car and I screamed MF so loud. The people that were passing the car probably thought I was talking to them, but I was just so pissed. Not that I was surprised. It was just the length in which, which he took his commentary on that particular show. And I'm thinking to myself, I told a lady many years later, the sentiment of the song came from me being a little boy in church listening to the preacher, the pastor, or whatever you want to call that person that was in front of the pulpit, at the end of the sermon, he would always say, won't you come? Won't you come inside the Lord? Won't you come? And he'd hold his hands out. It was so hypnotic, so compelling, so rich, that he held on to it until I was in my, <laughs> until I was in my 30s. And asked by this lady, I love so dearly. Leon, let's write something erotic but sentimental. I said, Minnie, I've got an idea I've been holding on to for years because you'd have to be, let's say, risky enough and you'd have to love what it says enough to want to sing it. And when I sung her the phrase, she says, I want to do that. I want to do that. I want to do that. And then with the music, which has always oh, been my gift, it was easy because I already had some chords. And she started singing. And we were in the, we, I think we sat up that night, wrote pretty much, me, her and her husband, Dick Rudolph, wrote that song almost in the evening. 
Of course, you're talking about Inside My Love. Inside My Love, and it still is a song that resonates and I meet most young singers. If I'm working with them, uh, uh, unconditionally, 100%, I'm always asked, can I sing that song? That song that you did with many. So, as provocative as the phrase is, and as rich as the meaning is, the two go together and I'm glad that I can sit here and say, as far as the, we're talking about ladies, she was the personification of a real woman. She was a real lady. She was motherly. You know, she was very feminine, and very sexy. Uh, One of my favorite and, songs that you did with her is Can You Feel What I'm Saying? Yes. And again, uh, not to slight or put slack on the, uh, on the young, beautiful talent of the day, but hopefully there are men like myself that remind them remind them that females should be females, not be looked at as a whore or a quick fix or spreading your legs too wide or all the things that this marketplace for the past 20 years I've watched the de desecration, hearing young rappers say, bitch, I'm gonna do this to you, I'm gonna do that to you. I said to a young rapper, and I say to young people that are listening now, one thing to say something sexy, another thing to say something sensual makes a big difference. Speaking of which, um, we recently um, interviewed and had Giovanka over recently. Oh, I um, love her. Which is an amazing artist. Lady. And you She's a lady. With her, yeah. She's a lady. She hasn't, for, she hasn't forgot her femininity and how rich it is and how, how dearly important it is to all of the skies, you know. <laughs> we love them when they come, they walk, when a lady walks past you and you, and you can smell the perfume. The perfume is an allure, it's an elixir. You don't need anything else. That's, that's why babies are made. <laughs> but it's the thing that, why humanity is humanity. Why men are still men. Because there is a thing about the, the I'd say the attraction, the magnetic force between female and male, that it, it, it comes from just a woman walk, walking in the room. You don't have to have, you don't have to have a physical aroma. It's just a look. There can be six guys standing in the corner over here talking. The moment a woman walks through that door, conversations change, tones change. Guys stand up a little straighter. <laughs> <laughs> so, so back back to your recording, Chris. You you had your own solo albums, your own yes um, uh, release, as opposed to working with everyone else. Uh, on United Artists, and then um, you were signed to um, Gordy, weren't you? I was signed, my first contract was with, actually, it wasn't with Gordy, with, with a gentleman. United that, Artists was first, but no, before no. that. My first contract was with, uh, I never did an album for them, but I was due to, with a gentleman that wound up being one of the big heads at um, CBS. His name was LeBaron Taylor. Unfortunately, LeBaron is not with us anymore, but LeBaron started a company called, uh, I think it was Radio City. I'm not sure, I don't want to say, because at that time, I, I was one of my closest friends, who is now very, very, very successful, very well known. It's just as crazy as it was when we were kids, but. Uh, his name is George Quinton, because me and George were signed to the same, but not signed, we were, George's first hit was the last song on my first production session. That song was, I Want to Testify. And that was my first contract as an artist and as a producer. Um, I found myself being asked one time, actually at a a party kind of, and it wasn't necessarily for me, but Jill Varka was there. And one of the young men in Holland asked me, you know, I was listening to one of the Four Tops old pieces. I could swear I hear in the background, Leon. I said, but I've never done anything. I stopped my face and said, I've never done anything with Motown. <laughs> I'm laughing because the guy that I'm speaking of was very given into doing very slick things. So having my voice on some things, that might have happened, whether that's true or not, but 
I was trying to figure out how could my voice be on something of the four tops. Or it was, it was one of the four tops. It was one of the grooves at Motown at the time. I think it was the four tops. Because he was saying how much he liked the record. And I'm saying, but I never did anything with the four tops. Anyway, um, Giovanka. Glad she is developing into being the artist that she should be. Um, I, start, I, I met her when she was working with a group called The Juice. I don't know if you're familiar with them. Mm -hmm. And I worked with them. I think I produced four or five things with them before it dissolved, like lots of unfortunately groups do because of just time and space. And a group thing is hard to keep together anyway. But I met her then. I think three years later, I discovered that she was doing a record of my own and happily found out that she's got quite a public in Japan. So I go to Japan sometimes twice a year. I haven't been this year. Japan, if you're watching, I'm looking for that call. Uh, I, but I love being there. The people are so adoring. The, the part of being an artist, they make so important to you. They make you realize it's like being in London for the first time. And there was a song here that I did with Shandy Siegel called Why I Came to California. Mm -hmm. It was released in America. It didn't really get released because it got cut off because the company got changed. So that whole album got ditched. But I get on the stage here at the desk cafe, my first performance, and I hadn't, didn't, didn't have that song in my list. Do you know I had so many screams in it? Why are you not saying why I came to California? I said, I didn't know you people even knew the song existed. But get, to make, make a point, London is the reason why I love coming to London and to Europe. The Europeans have a depth of love for the music, the same music. Because yeah. your, your, um, your solo albums here are huge. The, I the, didn't know that. The classics. I didn't know that. Yeah. But again, the appreciation, the love, the adoration, it's so rich. Uh, as I said to someone, I could never, I've been patted on the head, have been supported verbally and in some ways financially so long, I could never, I, I'm disappointed in people that do have egos or aren't pleased to sign a, 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 an autograph or are are not really aware of how much they should thank the people that love them. Not only thank them, know that they sh that, that adoration is spiritual. It's not only special and it cannot be bought. When people love you, they love you because what you are and what you've said in your art has touched them here and they've done more than be entertained by you. They've done the best thing I say to all artists on the planet. The best thing that, that can happen to you and the artist is that that artist, uh, is that that listener, who, some people say, well, I only listen. I said to a lady, please understand, your only being a listener is the reason why I'm what I am. And the best part is they take you home with them. You become a part of their life. Mm. So much so I've had the greatest honor any man can have in life from his art having some people come into an interview I was doing and the lady is pregnant and I come out and she says to me, his name is Leon. I want you to know, man, that that is more than an honor. That's so spiritual because you say to yourself, manifestation in life is so rich for many things. You see things happen. In the world of being an artist, what happens, three, three, I say there's more things, but there's three things. Starts with a fan, become a, fan, a, a friend, then become your family. Mm -hmm. Nothing better. So I say to young artists, I say, just don't, remember, just, just don't forget how important it is to show the world and the people that love you how much you love what you're doing because that's why they love you. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've, you've, you've given us, I know, we could talk for hours about all this, you've given us so much music over the years in terms of the stuff you've written for other people, the stuff you've done yourself. You famously obviously did the Marvin Gaye I Want You album and there's reams and reams of classic music that you've done, you know, I Want to Be Where You Are, and it's been recorded by so many people. 
Um, but for you, what's the what's the most? Can you pick out one no. moment that's a special? No. Is it just like a, a journey or? What's... I, I I like I like saying this because I've asked that quite often, and since I've seen this interview, I kind of love seeing it because it connects me to someone that I. I might get slapped for saying this, but he's a real artist. I don't consider myself as real as the artist that I'm going to mention his name. But because he said something so rich when being asked the question, Mr. Picasso, what is your favorite work? And this is a live, a live interview of him, very few caught on film. His answer was, he held his hand up, he says, which is my favorite finger? God, I said, Fuck, wow, that's deep. Because what's that saying is that everything he's ever done is a part of him. Mm -hmm. And because the world picks a few of these pieces that we spend our life doing, and we get a little accolade from it, a little of this or that, but or as I'm concerned, I loved it because I had said that in other ways to people. There are some works that some people will never hear because I'm very private. Although, I have a young man that's working with me that said, he had worked with me for about four months, he said. He was doing like a bit of a biography on me. He says, you know, I discovered something about you that a lot of people will never know. I said, what's that? I said, you're very private, aren't you? And I looked at him, I said, you know what? He's the first person I've ever worked with in my whole life that ever picked that up. He says, because how is it that you could be as, have, have the desire to be as private as you are? And you're an artist, a well-known artist. I said, well, that sucks, doesn't it? <laughs> but it's the game that life plays on you. And I had, I, and I had, my, had, I had my choice. I would take the adage that was said to me about two years ago that I found very rich. Did you know that most of the things us humans live by, live off of, live with, were done by people that chose anonymity? Did you know that? No, I didn't know. Well, not that it, we have to look far because a lot of the great inventions are taken credit for by people that chose to take credit for. But when the truth is really told, a lot of our great inventions were, were done by people that were so rich inside themselves, they didn't want any accolade. They didn't want you to know they did it. And true artists can stand making an, uh, taking uh, the place of making something like a Michelangelo and stand back and watch the world cry, laugh, joy, and be as much of a part of the, the world's life as ever, and have the pride of knowing I did it from here, and I didn't want it to be bastardized, bastardized or promoted, or sold, or known to be doing something. I like, as I've said to people, I like my work to be known further than my name. Which brings us. Um, right back to the beginning again, which is what you talked about, is you do this because you love it. Oh, not so much. It's a job or a career. It's my religion. Where, so um, I'd just like to thank you so much for coming down to my soul and talking to us. I'd like to um, thank you so much for having me because it gives me a chance to say things that my wife says to me, uh, I'm always complimented for being as open as I am. And she says, you, and, and you don't write anything down. I said, you know why? I said, because you don't have to write what's in your heart. You don't. It's there. I'm, I'm actually always waiting for moments like this so I can tell, hopefully tell people that are the young set and talk to people that are my age and have them understand where I'm coming from, where some artists really come from. Because you get a lot of accolade, you get a lot of hits that people think you're supposed to be. Because uh, they run into some people that have what you call big heads and ladies that become what we call Hi. divas. Divas? I've worked with a few of those. <laughs> I'm sure you have. It's okay because I love them anyway, but I just remind people that that talent that you got, the gift that we have, is a second in time. So how how can you qualify the fact that you're going to get off on a second and want somebody to kiss you in places that you shouldn't 
because of this is second in time that somebody, the world is saying, I love you, from the Biebers to the Presleys to the, all the people that, I, that I, I know of and the people that I know, that I've known, that have been really rich talents. And interestingly enough, some of the people that I know, I won't mention their names, that, I've, that you know and the world knows, are so rich inside here. The only thing, the only problem they have is oh, the whole world knows them. Mm. They love them, but they don't know how rich the person is in here because it's in here where it comes from. And the accolade is because of earthlings and how earthlings put things together and where we are right now. I guarantee you, a thousand years from now, it's going to be different. I think music will be, be considered as medicine, not only as entertaining. It's already in hospitals, and I thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you very much. I thank your audience and whoever is listening for listening to it. I call myself an old lech. And the word lech, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it's okay because I, I feel good in saying it because I'm honest. I'm, I'm right down to earth. I haven't been jaded. And I hope the people that could be jaded won't be because what the world is showing you now is their love. Don't confuse it. They're not kissing your ass. Excuse me. <laughs> Mr. Leon Way.